welcome to your diploma in clinical hypnotherapy and NLP. And you have this lovely book, don't you? And it's full of exciting information, a lot of which I'm going to bring to life for you. Don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and read the entire book to you, but I will pick out salient points. And I want to begin, are you sitting comfortably? Very. Yes, thank you. I want to begin by telling you my story of how I came to hypnotherapy. I was a Louise Hay teacher since 1994. And in my other life, my working life, I was a corporate trainer. The two worlds are very different. And I went on an NLP course merely to keep myself marketable. Because the thing at the time, back in the early 2000s, the thing at the time was to learn NLP because that was the latest thing. We all needed the qualification in NLP. And my NLP course happened to include also some hypnotherapy. I wasn't too interested in that part. It was all about the NLP for me. And I'd been doing guided meditation for many years prior to that. So it was quite a surprise to me to have the two things combined. And even now I find many hypnotherapy courses are quite separate to NLP courses. And then, as you know, your book is both. Your book is the Diploma in Clinical Hypnotherapy. How is that different to ordinary hypnotherapy? And what's all this NLP about? So I've written a few things on the board, as you can see. Though, first of all, to tell you my take on it before I knew anything about hypnosis and NLP, I, I, before I knew anything about anything that's written on this board, I was doing guided meditations for people and it was all very well and good, lovely, fabulous, wonderful results. A lovely time was had by all. And so on the first week of my diploma course, when I was learning, to me, it was all about guided meditation, which is wonderful. I've been doing it for a long time and I was a little bit bored. Now at the end of that first week, the guy that was presenting did something to me that was quite astonishing. He very rapidly put somebody into trance and then asked them questions. And I thought, they can talk? Nobody told me they could talk in this deep meditative state. And so I began to define for myself as well as assimilating all the information from elsewhere, exactly what hypnosis is, what hypnotherapy is, and of course what NLP is. We'll leave NLP out of it for the moment. We've got enough on the board to keep ourselves going. To define hypnosis and the hypnotic state, we can analyze, we can look as you will find in your book or in the text below as we do walk through this course you will find there are things that we can electronically measure to determine if someone is in the hypnotic state and there are things that we can physically observe and this is what makes it different and as we do with many things, in order to define something, we compare it with something else. And I'm comparing it with meditation here. Now, some people will say to me and talk to me about self-hypnosis. And we still have arguments at the top of the profession because you know I'm a senior of the General Hypnotherapy Standards Council. We still have discussions, heated debates about what the definition ought to be because some books will say it's a relaxed focused state of concentration and other books will say particularly of the american kind is that it's a bypass of the critical factor and what does that actually mean the critical factor really being the part of your consciousness with either which either deliberately lets in 
and keeps out certain information. So what is the hypnotic state and how does it differ? And what is hypnotherapy? Well, the therapy part of it can tell you that it's a therapeutic intervention when you've established the hypnotic state. Though I will tell you that until you have the hypnotic state developed and sustained within your subject, within your client, there's hardly any point in reading a script or putting your heart and soul into some very profound and wonderful therapeutic intervention because the critical factor is still there and will keep you out. So let's just look at the two things because it's a basis for discussion. What is hypnosis compared to meditation? Well, hypnosis takes two. So self-hypnosis, I'm afraid this is where we have all these discussions, does not exist. Yes, self-hypnosis is meditation. And wonderful and powerful and fabulous it is too. But if I needed some therapeutic intervention, if I needed my unconscious addressed because I knew I was doing something unconsciously that wasn't to my benefit, and I wanted that addressed, I'd go and see another hypnotist. Certainly a hypnotherapist. When I say the term hypnotist, does that perhaps engage with you um, scenes of stage hypnotism when I say hypnotist just just yeah usually usually it's more theatrical hypnotist yeah. yeah so the stage hypnotist can put subjects into a hypnotic trance quite quickly and if you've ever been to a hypnosis show you'll find that the certain suggestibility tests done first and then even when those subjects are on stage, certain ones, perhaps without your awareness in the audience, are discarded along the way because mm -hmm. they're not good subjects for the, for the particular show in mind. So the self-hypnosis to me is a meditative state, which is wonderful, but if you were terrified of a spider, Unless you were some profound yogi and had absolute control, you wouldn't probably be frightened of a spider if you were. Um, by going into a meditation, you probably then couldn't hold the spider afterwards. Mm -hmm. you know, we measure um, the effectiveness of hypnosis by its results. So hypnosis takes two. It's, it's, it's something that is orchestrated by a skilled individual. That individual almost is an agent between your conscious mind and your unconscious and explores the two and the relationships between. Because why would somebody go and see a hypnotist or hypnotherapist? Usually because they're doing something that they don't want to do or they want to do something that they feel they can't do. They're almost at war with themselves, the conscious and the unconscious. So a hypnotist, a hypnotherapist, comes into your arena and holds the two states of consciousness and unconsciousness. Now, when I use the term unconscious, some people say subconscious. Well, you've got a consciousness, your ordinary waking consciousness. You've got a subconscious. You've got an unconscious beneath that. But you've also got a higher consciousness and a super consciousness. And these are all levels of mind that really need to be explained in a more scientific way. So is just underneath consciousness. So we're aiming for the unconscious. Now, if you are truly unconscious in the dictionary definition, you, you'd be in the deepest level of sleep or knocked out by somebody lying on the floor. We want to engage with that unconscious part of the mind. And it's interesting to go to the scientific brainwave state model where 
normally in normal waking consciousness this is the beta wave state beta waves are a certain pattern and frequency of brainwave activity that we associate with normal waking consciousness the alpha state is a, a different state to that it's a slowing down state of that it's the meditative state it's a lovely wonderful state it's also the hypnotic state so in terms of brainwave activity these two are the same so let's take sleep it's the closest we can come really to um, understanding the hypnotic state sleep when you go to sleep tonight you'll be in a beta wave state and then you'll go down to alpha and then you'll get to delta and theta and delta those states one's uh, the REM state where your your eyeballs uh, move under your eyelids and you can see people um, visualizing when they're dreaming and their eyeballs are moving you've heard of the, the REM, REM state? Sleep. yeah and then the the delta state is far below that it's a much deeper level of sleep and if you are roused from delta state you really know about it it's, oh, you really are shocked out of it now it's not that you just progressively go through those states and remain there until morning and then come up again no in true sleep you, you, you go down a bit, you come up a bit, you go down a bit, come up a bit, do, 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 do. and certainly if you're sleeping in a place you don't sleep regularly, when you go on holiday, stay at a friend's house, you'll find that your unconscious mind, which is always listening out, will alert you to sounds that are completely safe and ordinary to other inhabitants of the building, but to you they're new. So your unconscious will kind of keep calling in your conscious mind and saying, is this okay? I thought I'd just wake you. I just thought I'd call in the conscious mind just to see if this is all right. Those were plates clanking and it's two o'clock in the morning. We don't have plates clanking at two o'clock in the morning in our home, etc. So the, the brainwave state is important. But what a hypnotist, now I'm talking about hypnosis, not hypnotherapy now. What a hypnotist will do can do there's various ways to hypnotize somebody they can engage with your unconscious mind so quickly that they drop you right down into the doldrums right down probably to a theta or delta state hmm. you'll come up a little bit and choose whether you want to return to full conscious awareness and this is the point where the stage hypnotists dismiss certain people on stage thank you very much would you like to go back to your seat thank you hmm. okay. because the person on stage isn't playing the piano with their elbows like you said <laughs> they're just they can be used as bookends by the way to prop up <laughs> the participants they can just stay there oh. <laughs> what they're saying in their mind i'm not going to do that no i can imagine myself doing that on stage i'm not going to do that so there's there's these different state of brainwave activity and the one that we associate with hypnosis ordinarily and hypnotherapy is the same as the meditative state but it's different from the meditative state because hypnosis takes two it's your responsibility as the hypnotist and it's a big responsibility to keep that person safe and to orchestrate the whole process so you determine where they are in terms of that brainwave state activity. You see, some people would say to me, particularly on the first day of the course, oh, I was very relaxed, but I don't think I was hypnotized. And maybe the same person that evening takes a recording of mine and goes um, maybe to the car, this has happened, they've gone to the car, um, and listen to something in the car, relax the, um, recline the chair right back. Because there's no, in the, I'm going back a while now, 
in the olden days, there was no uh, DVD player or CD player in the hotel. So they played it in the car. And then as soon as the DVD stopped, they'd be, oh, okay, back to full conscious awareness. And they'd say to me, well, it was very relaxing, but I don't think I was hypnotized. And then others would say, well, how come you opened your eyes then when she told you to come out of trance? Because you, if, the, if you were very tired as she was, surely you just kind of drift into sleep. Mm. So the, the state is orchestrated by the hypnotist. So that's my first point, And I'd like to hear from both of you what you think about what I've just said. Go ahead, Nick. After you, Teresa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> stage hypnosis, I've actually been hypnotized twice. <laughs> And it's very much, and I, it works really well for me. I feel like I'm not hypnotized. I'm just following along because I'm very easygoing. Um, but the one thing I notice is afterwards, I feel amazing. So even though I think I was just very relaxed, it's like this supercharged, amazing feeling I feel. So um, yes, it was very relaxing, but I do know I was hypnotized, even though in the time, I don't think I am. I think I'm just playing along. Was there any sort of recording so you could play yes. back what you've done? What did yes. you do? Oh, I did lots of stuff, but not it's stuff that I would I would always do. Like I'm very comfortable on stage, so it's very easy for me. So, um, yeah, it's not it's not difficult to get me to do stuff on stage because I'm I'm very stage friendly. What would you not do? Probably nothing. <laughs> we one guy I went to see. Um, was quite blue as they are sometimes here in in England yeah and at the point where he got um uh blow up inflatables I mean there was a a blow up inflatable penis yeah and at that point where he was he was to allow the penis to have a sexual interaction with him he came out of trance <laughs> um but I suppose if you've got that awareness Teresa that well, it's only play acting anyway. See, I think he thought, the participant in the show, that it was real, that, that there was a man there with a penis. Yeah, that was no, going I, never, I never got that low. I so, always knew it was playing. So you know it's play acting and you yeah. engage to that point, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. not really hypnotised. You play, just like we did when we were in the playground as children, you play acting and enjoying yeah. it and going along right. with it. Yeah. 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 What do you think, Nick? So I've, I've been to a couple of hip, hypnotist shows <clears throat> and on one of them, they tried to hypnotize me. Now I've got quite a logical mind um, and I won't, I am a playful character and I love having fun with friends, um, but I didn't play along. And I was one of the people that he asked to go back to the audience. Um, in actual fact, he did whisper in my ear, just play along, just play along. Um, but it wasn't, it's not my nature. If I feel it, I'll do it. If I don't, I won't. So, but I've also been hypnotized as, as Jenny will know. Um, and I've experienced that level of, um, that level of calm and relaxedness where your conscious is still there, but very quiet. Um, and, and I've seen people be hypnotized where, during during a deep hypnosis trance, um, through suggestion, their arms start to rise, start to rise from the chair, start to rise, and you can always see them start to frown because they don't understand why their arm is rising. So it's quite interesting to see how, when you're in that theta state and delta state, that how strong the power of suggestion is to your unconscious mind. So yeah, it's good. Yeah. What's interesting is I have only ever been hypnotized maybe twice. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had people try about 40 times. So besides, yeah. So play acting, no problems. Go along with it. But when it's yeah. like seriously therapeutic, my mind won't give up. Mm. Now, which part of your mind won't give up, I wonder? <laughs> I don't know. That's uh -huh. what I'm here for. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, there are many, many levels to the mind, and we can't be aware of them all at the same time. Though we, we make attempts, even the scientists, we make attempts to fathom the intricacies of the mind. And 
I would say that hypnosis, as you've just talked about with the, the stage stuff, it's an active process. People, people can be dancing and scrubbing the deck of a ship and doing all sorts of things. And in therapeutic hypnosis, in hypnotherapy, where we employ the state of hypnosis to bring about a therapeutic intervention, in hypnotherapy, then that activeness is maybe them revisiting some childhood trauma or past life or something that is active. Whereas usually one's perception of meditation is passive. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, if you can go to a still point in the mind and if you can release your fears and worries, etc., and it's a passive thing. You can do it alone. I know you can do it in groups as well, but most people have their own individual experience. Even with guided meditation, no matter how led you are in meditation, it's normally your own experience. Well, I smelt the sea, well, I heard the waves, I saw the blue sky, etc. So it's, it's active. The hypnotist themselves guides the person to experience what the hypnotist wants them to experience. And the hypnotist wants them to experience it in order to bring about this profound change in an hour. You know, the person's been smoking for 40 years, but they expect to be changed within an hour. And so um, it has to be active and the hypnotist has to be very skilled. It's also energetic. It's a very energetic breath. The energy might be mostly seated in the hypnotist, but it's an energetic process. It often involves um, some um, interaction that's physical, though the, the process itself is um, an energetic one rather than calm, rather than just, just, just be calm and still. There's, before I go on, do you have any comments or questions about nope. that, about the differences between the two? No. Nope. I know Nick is a very skilled, uh, would you call them meditator? Meditator. I've been called many things in my time, Jenny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I practice meditation. I also teach it, yeah. So I'm very keen to, to find out um, if there's discussion that comes as a result of this. So with, with meditation, um, you spoke before about changes. Um, it's more a passive thing. Uh, you're, you're right to, to a degree, but with meditation, changes happen in your brain, as in blood flow changes. Uh, and over time, it strengthens different parts of your brain. So there's, there's four main different meditations. Um, and whereas a hypnotherapy session can help you with these changes in one or maybe two sessions. You spoke before about sort of emotional reactions to spiders. If somebody was to meditate for 20 minutes a day for a month and with the right meditation, they would have the same result, maybe two months, maybe three months, because the brain would become more in control of their emotional responses. However, that's a long time. Meditation works wonders but it's a long process and most people don't have the patience or, or, the, or the, well, the patience to, to, for their mind to be trained to be calm. Because when you first start to meditate, most people's minds are like this, so they give up after a few times. Whereas with the hypnotherapy, um, it's something where you can see somebody like yourself, Jenny, and within an hour or two, um, it's done because you've changed the programming as opposed to strengthening the muscle within the brain. But, yeah. Uh, very well Does that, explained. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. <clears throat> We're very lucky to have Nick with us, really, to make this comparison and to make it very clear what those differences are. I think there are some very well-intentioned and very skilled hypnotherapists about, but basically they're limiting themselves and the effects on their clients because they're often reading something that's very well put together and it's a very wonderful process though the unconscious mind of the client might be fighting against certain um, parts of that script and what the 
hypnotist will do is engage with the resistance that is within the client because if the resistance wasn't there they wouldn't be coming to see a hypnotherapist you know and um going back to what nick said there was someone on the course uh, many years ago who did frantic hand washing and his hands are ocd and we're told by the standards council not to deal with certain conditions and one of them is OCD but it was at the back of my mind that Paul McKenna actually did a series uh, called uh, I can heal your life emphasis on the I you know, it's a bit, uh, you know all about Paul McKenna do you over there in Canada yep. oh, no. <laughs> okay. you'll research him later okay um, a TV hypnotist here who started as a stage hypnotist and then transferred to the kind of healing arts um, so this Paul McKenna had a TV show called I Can Heal Your Life and he purposely picked people with conditions that you weren't supposed to be able to help uh, one was blindness for example